हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू फिजिक्स वाला इंग्लिश चैनल माय नेम इज शालिनी सोमशेखर एंड आई एम योर बॉटनी टीचर इन टुडेज सेशन आई एम गोइंग टू बी स्टार्टिंग विद अ ब्रांड न्यू बॉटनी चैप्टर कॉल्ड मोफोलॉजी ऑफ फ्लावरिंग प्लांट्स दिस इज द फिफ्थ चैप्टर इन योर इलेवेंथ ग्रेड सिलेबस and we have split this chapter into three different lectures so this is going to be the first lecture of the chapter morphology of flowering plants so without any further ado let's get today's session started i'll quickly take you through all of the things that we are going to be covering in this session firstly we learn about the different parts of the plant following that we will learn about the modifications and morphology of root stem and leaves all right so let's begin by understanding what exactly the term morphology means so when you look at the term morphology and you split it into two the term morpho or morphe which is derived from greek means shape or form and logy i'm sure all of you are already familiar with what that means you've uh, heard the word or the part logy in biology zoology geology everywhere so basically logy or logos it means the study of so morphology is basically that branch of science which deals with the study of shape form and structure all right so what is morphology again it is the branch of science that deals with the study of shape form and structure All right that's exactly what we are going to be doing in this chapter as well as the name of the chapter itself indicates morphology of flowering plants we are going to be focusing on the morphology of angiosperms we learn about its roots stems leaves flowers fruit seed all of the different parts in an angiosperm plant all right so now let's move on and quickly recollect all the different parts of a plant that we've learnt in our lower grades all right we'll start from the roots and go up so if you look at a typical angiospermic plant there are there is some part of the plant that lies below the ground below the soil and there is an ascending part of the plant that is above the soil all right so usually generally what we say is the part of the plant that lies below the ground is called uh it represents the root system of the plant and the part of the plant that is found above the gro uh, ground or the soil surface that is referred to as the shoot system so below the soil we have root above the soil we have the stem and the stem you have a main central axis and this will bear branches leaves flowers and fruits right so in the stem you can find leaves flowers roots and within the fruits obviously you will find the seeds right so what we are going to do in the course of this chapter is in this exact same order we are going to learn about the different parts of a plant basically the morphology of all of these parts starting with the root then we'll move on to the stem then to the leaves then to flowers fruits and finally the seed all right so this is what we are going to learn in this chapter So let's begin by talking about the root. So what is a root in a plant? It is the part of the plant that develops from the radicle of the seed. Uh I'm sure you've learned about the parts of a seed in lower grades as well. So you know within the seed there is the embryo which becomes the future plant. So within the embryo there are parts called the radicle and plumule which you may have heard about before right so within the seed within the embryo there is a part known as the radicle so generally it is the radicle that will form the root okay why i'm saying generally you will know shortly 
there are exceptions but usually it is the radical which will give rise to the root one easy way for you to remember this is root begins with r radical also begins with r so it is the radical part of the seed that will eventually give rise to the root right so the first point about root is that it usually develops from the radical of the seed generally found underground again we are saying generally okay it's not uh, always most of the time roots are found under the soil so they are underground they are generally non green that means they are not photosynthetic because they are found under the soil their functions are different and they are not green what are its primary functions what are the functions of roots we've learnt in lower grades as well that roots have two very important primary functions to perform in a plant one is anchorage what does anchorage mean anchorage means it helps the plant stay attached to the substratum to the soil right so roots will hold the plant firmly in the soil that is what anchorage is and the second function is absorption about this you all know it is through the roots that water and minerals present in the soil are absorbed right so two important very important primary functions in a root is that they help in anchorage they help the plant attached to the soil secondly they help in absorption absorption of what absorption of water and minerals from the soil and they later transport it to wherever it is required in the plant so this is basically about some general points about the root okay so here you can see an illustration a diagram where here you can see the seed uh, so within the seed this region is the embryo part of the seed this red color part here that itself is the radical eventually this radical is what will give rise to the root that is what this illustration here represents i hope this much is clear all right now let's move on there are three different types of root systems that we can see in angiosperms they are tap root system fibrous root system and adventitious root system i'm sure you must have heard about tap root system and fibrous root system adventitious root system may be new to you all right nonetheless i'm going to discuss each of them in detail all right so let's begin with the first type of root system which is the tap root system so what happens is i already told you that the radical part of the seed is what will usually give rise to the roots right so what happens in a tap root system is the radical which is present in the seed it will directly elongate and give rise to the tap root system okay so whatever i'm highlighting over here in this illustration this primary root is formed due to the direct elongation of the radical that was present in the seed now this type of root system there are lateral roots present lateral means sides okay so from this primary root i'm going to label this here okay so this is the let's call it the primary root branches will arise from the primary root and later you can see branches that are arising directly from the primary root from that root again some more branches will arise all right so these branches from the primary root that are directly arising from the primary root these are called the secondary uh, branches and the ones that further arise from the secondary are called the tertiary roots okay so what happens here is in this root in this type of root system we can see lateral roots arising from the primary root from the sides of this primary root you can see branches arising and one thing we have to keep in mind here is that the primary root secondary root tertiary root these are all not equal in thickness this one is going to be the thickest will have the largest diameter followed by secondary and then tertiary so as the branching continues the diameter or the thickness of the branches of this type of root system is going to go on decreasing all right so this kind of root system you can usually find in dicotyledonous plants one example for which 
is mustard. All right. So this is about the first type of root system, which is called tap root system. Now, let's move on to the second type of root system, which is called fibrous root system. Now, over here, what happens is the radical that is supposed to give rise to the root system that will initially give rise to the root, but that primary root is short lived. All right, so we say it is ephemeral. Ephemeral is another term that we use to say that something is short lived. What happens here is the primary root that initially arose from the radical, it does not live for a long time, it will die out. After that, from the base of the stem, roots will start arising. So, in fibrous root system, the roots will start arising from the base of the stem, which is what you can see here. All right, so this is the stem from the base of the stem like a tuft of roots are arising from the bottom part. And as you can see, this is highly, highly branched. And uh, this kind of root system is usually found in monocots. You can observe it in plants like wheat, banana, grasses, all of that. Okay. One thing that you must keep in mind about fibrous root system is that unlike tap root system where you saw the primary root was the thickest followed by secondary then followed by tertiary here you do not see much differentiation like that most of the roots that arise from the base of the stem will usually have uniform thickness all right they'll all be equally almost equally thick right so that's about the second type of root system which is um, fibrous root system now moving on we we'll learn about the third type of root system, which is adventitious root system. If you remember, at the beginning of the session, when I spoke about the different points under the root, I said that roots generally or usually arise from the radical. And I also mentioned that there are exceptions, right? So this is the exception that I was talking about. So adventitious roots are those roots that arise from parts other than the radical. It could arise from the stem for example, right? So if they are not formed from the radical, but from other parts of the plant, then we refer to it as adventitious roots. All right. Some examples of that is Monstera and Banyan. I'm sure you would have seen this plant. It is a very, very uh, famous ornamental plant that you will see in houses, in offices, in restaurants. It has beautiful large leaves. So in this plant, you can see from the stem roots arising. So this is an example for adventitious root. Another example that you may have seen is the roots that you find in banyan tree. In banyan tree, which is a dicotyledonous tree, normal tap roots do exist. But along with that, you can see roots arising from the branches. They droop down and grow towards the soil, right? So these roots that start off from the branches and droop down towards the soil, these are adventitious roots because obviously they are not arising from the radical but from some other part of the plant which is the stem or the branches in this case. Alright, so banyan also is an example. I mean these roots of banyan are examples of adventitious roots. Now, we will have to learn about the different regions in a root. So, when you take a small portion of any root at the tip you can find certain distinct regions present at the tip of the root at the lower portion of the root about which we're going to learn right now all right so when you enlarge this it's going to look like this so what you're observing here or this ncrt diagram that you see this is actually this portion of roots all right now in such portions of roots, like I said, you can identify some distinct regions about which I am going to talk right now. Pay heed to it. This is important for your board exams as well as competitive exams. All right. Now, we will start from the tip and move forward. So, here at the tip of the root, you will find something called the root cap. Okay. So, what I am going to highlight over here right now. So, this portion is the root cap. Now, in your NCRT, it is given that this is a thimble-like structure. It is protective in function.
what does thimble mean it's a cap like or a thimble like structure thimble is something that uh, people who sew a lot like a ta tailors they use to protect their fingertips from the pricking action of the needle okay so similar to how a thimble protects the fingertips the root cap protects the root tip because what lies ahead of this is really really important for the growth of the root so in order to protect whatever lies ahead of it about which i'm going to explain in just a bit uh, which is the region of meristematic activity how do i move this around all right so um, the root cap basically protects the region of meristematic activity which lies above this uh, and also an important function of the root cap is that it secretes mucilage basically it secretes mucus like substance into the soil so that the root tip is protected why should it be protected remember as the roots are growing it will have to go in between the soil particles right because it's inside the soil and because of friction there is high chances of the root tip to get damaged in order to prevent that or in order to protect the root tip the root cap secretes mucilaginous substances to lubricate that and to uh, kind of minimize the friction and damage that that can happen at the root tips apart from that it's also believed that it is the root cap that perceives gravity and grows towards the soil all right so that's about the root cap now the next region above the root cap is this region let me use a different color just a minute so this region here this is the second region it is the region of meristematic activity i'm not sure if you can fully see it here so this is the region of meristematic activity okay so this is the region of meristematic activity you know growth of organisms or any part a uh, plant part or any part of animals also can happen because of two things now when an organism has a 100 cells if those cells divide and become 200 cells and still remains the same size you can see growth because there is an increase in the number of cells the organism has 100 cells initially now it has 200 cells obviously it will show growth another reason why growth can be observed is when the cells increase in size there were 100 smaller size cells each cell has accumulated more cytoplasm and grown bigger in size then that also contributes to growth here this region of meristematic activity will have very small cells with dense cytoplasm and a very prominent nucleus and over here you can see that the cells are very actively dividing because they are constantly dividing they will keep on adding more and more cells to the root one becomes two two then becomes four so these cells are dividing dividing and giving rise to more cells in the root which will contribute to the growth of the root all right so um that is about the region of meristematic activity and this like i already said will definitely contribute to the growth of the root a little ahead of this region of meristematic activity you can find the region of elongation which i will try to represent here using blue color all right so this is the region of elongation which is the third region in the root so what happens here is as the cells start dividing one more thing you have to remember the region of meristematic activity as it divides and forms more cells they will move to the towards the root cap as well as towards the uh, elongation region so what happens here in the region of elongation or the zone of elongation is the cells kind of stop dividing and start increasing in size specifically in this axis which is the longitudinal axis with respect to this root right so as the cells start increasing in size by accumulating more cytoplasm and becoming longer they will start looking elongated kind of rectangular which is why this region is called the region of elongation 
Now, both region of elongation as well as region of meristematic activity will contribute to the growth of the root. What happens in the region of meristematic activity? Cells are constantly dividing. They will increase the number of cells and contribute to the growth. Whereas in the region of elongation, the cells will stop dividing. They are not increasing in number. But whatever cells are produced by the region of meristematic activity, they stop dividing and they start elongating, increasing in size in the longitudinal axis. And by increasing in size in the longitudinal axis, they will contribute to the growth of the plant in terms of its length. Okay, so as the cells become longer and longer, the root uh, also grows longer, right? So that's about this region, the third region, which is called the region of elongation. Now let's move forward and look at the next region in the root, which is the region of maturation. Now in this region, the cells would have differentiated they would have taken up permanent functions in the plant they no longer increase in size or they are not dividing okay so they, they would have taken up other functions in the plant about which we learn in detail in the next chapter for now just remember over here the cells have matured they've taken up their permanent functions in the plant and this is called the region of maturation now one thing about the region of maturation is that they will have in this region the cells will have root hair so the cells that are present the outermost layer of cells that is present in the root of i'm sorry in the region of uh, maturation or differentiation these outermost layer of cells the uh, outermost layer of cells which we call the epidermis those cells will form very thin thread like extensions like this that will form the root hair. Now why should root hair be present? What is the function of root again? We learnt about two primary functions. First one being anchorage and the second one being absorption. Absorption is a very important function in roots. It has to absorb water and minerals. Now if the root did not have root hair the surface area that would be available for absorbing the nutrients and water from the soil would be much lesser. Now that the root hair are present in this region, the region of maturation or the region of differentiation, what happens is because of the presence of these root hair, the surface area that is available for absorbing water and minerals has obviously increased. So this region will help in absorption. It helps in absorption by increasing surface area. Alright, so as you can see, imagine the root not having all of this, the surface area would just be this much. Now that all of these root hair are present, the surface area has definitely increased multiple fold. Right, so that's about the different regions of the root. I'll quickly revise this. First you have the root cap at the bottom. It is protective in function. It is thimble-like and uh, it secretes mucus to, to lubricate and to uh, reduce the damage that occurs at the root tip. And it also protects the meristematic tissue that lies above it. The second region is the region of meristematic activity. Here cells divide repeatedly and increase in number and contributes to growth. Following that, you have region of elongation. Over here, the cells kind of stop dividing and start increasing in size in the longitudinal axis, which will give an appearance that it's elongating. So that region is the region of elongation. Both region of elongation and the region of meristematic activity will increase the length of the root. Following that, we have region of maturation where cells have taken up permanent functions. Over here, we will find a zone of root hair where the outermost layer of cells in this region of the root will give out thin thread-like extensions that are called root hair and that will increase the surface area available for absorption uh, for the root. Alright, I hope this much is clear. Now, let's talk about modifications of roots. Uh, so at the beginning of the lecture, I told you all the things that we'll be covering today and it included morphology and modification of root stem and leaves, right? So what exactly is modification? Now, I already mentioned that the function of the root is to anchor the plant to the substratum to the soil and to help in absorption of water minerals from the soil. 
if a root is performing any function in the plant apart from these two primary functions it is said to be modified clear the primary functions are absorption anchorage sometimes in some plants due to some circumstances you can find as adaptations that roots perform other functions other than storage i'm sorry other than absorption and anchorage and such modifications such changes are referred to as modifications so here it's very clearly written roots in some plants they change their shape and structure to perform functions other than their primary functions which are anchorage and absorption now such changes that we see in roots are said to be modifications we call them modifications and such roots are said to be modified now what are some examples where roots can be modified in some plants roots are modified to store food storing food is not a primary function of roots right if instead of helping in absorption and anchorage or along with helping in absorption and anchorage if the plant roots store food then that is considered to be a mod modification providing mechanical support or providing support to the plant is not a primary function of the root in some plants in some plants you can see that the roots provide support for the plant so that is a deviation from its primary functions which is anchorage and absorption if you're doing anything other than the primary functions then we call it modification similarly some plants plant roots help in respiration so all of these are modifications of roots okay so we learn with examples about each of these let's begin with roots modified well modified for storage so i'm sure all of you enjoy eating all of these but i don't know if you've ever wondered botanically what part of the plant you're eating so from now on you can keep that in mind every time you're eating a carrot you should know that you're eating a modified root right so in carrot in turnips and in sweet potatoes the roots are modified to store food which is why you see that it's swollen it's bulky because it's storing a lot of starch normally if you look at the uh, root of a grass plant or a mint plant you don't find such swollen roots if it's swollen it indicates that it's storing something okay so in this case carrots turnips and sweet potatoes the roots are storing food and they are root modifications carrot is an example of a tap root which is modified to store food turnip again is a tap root modification where a sweet potato is an adventitious root that is modified to store food these examples are very very important so you will have to kind of find a way to memorize them all so that you ace your exams right i hope this is clear roots if they are performing functions other than absorption anchorage they are called modifications here are examples for roots that are modified to store food there's carrot turnip both of which are tap roots and then we have sweet potato which is an adventitious root modification for storage right now i told you about um roots that help in providing support right here is a beautiful example of that and it is the banyan tree earlier i also told you that the banyan tree has uh, adventitious roots i gave the same example for adventitious roots as well because these roots don't arise from the radical now how do these okay so these are called prop roots basically how do these prop roots provide support to the banyan tree what is their need exactly if you think you will get the answer yourself because it's a a uh, very logical question you use your common sense you'll get the answer to this question so what happens is usually in these banyan trees the canopy is huge the tree tree trunk is like this and then you have like a huge canopy this single trunk itself will not be able to support the entire canopy the weight of this entire leaves and branches and all of that cannot be supported by this alone uh whenever there are heavy winds or anything it could topple off right so in order to hold this whole plant firmly to the soil it needs additional support right so what these plants do is from the branches roots will start arising they will gradually start growing downward go towards the soil towards the soil and eventually when they reach the soil they will firmly get attached and in that way it will act like additional support 
to help the plant stay in place. All right, so that is the function of these adventitious root modifications, and they are definitely clearly helping in providing support to the tree. Right, so these are called prop roots. Remember, this is important. Clear? Now let's take a look at the second example. Oh, before that, here's a fun fact for you. This huge tree, this huge tree that you're looking at here, is found in Andhra Pradesh in southern India, and it's about 550 years old. And this is in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the tree that has the largest canopy in the world. Okay, so as you can see here, the canopy of this single tree covers about one. 19107 meters so if you uh, related to terms of cricket pitches this is an area that is equal to the area of 300 cricket pitches that is how huge this one single tree's canopy is so if you live in uh, andhra pradesh or if you ever plan to visit andhra pradesh then you must definitely visit this place right so oh wait i think i forgot to mention its name it's called timamma marimannu Now let's move on to the second example where roots are modified to provide support. So over here, these are called stilt roots. This is the second example for root modifications providing support. The first one was prop roots, right? So this you can observe in maize and sugarcane, both of which are monocotyledonous plants, right? So here what happens is the stems of these plants are very slender. They are very thin. You don't see much branching here at all, right? So what happens is when these slender stems, I'll show it to you here, and they have fibrous roots, which usually don't go very deep into the soil. So the problem with these plant stems is that, again, similar to what I said in with respect to banyan tree, whenever there are heavy winds, because these plants are very light also, there are chances that this topples and falls off, right? So in order to prevent that, these plants have come up with a genius, genius mechanism where they give out roots from these nodes in the stem close to the soil. I'm sure you know what nodes are. Nodes are those regions in the stem from which the leaves arise. Okay, So from these nodes that are close to the soil, roots will start developing. And these roots again grow towards the soil, towards gravity in this direction and ultimately get attached to the soil providing extra support for this plant all right so these are called stilt roots and uh, here is an example of stilt roots in maize you can see how it's arising from this portion which is the node and it is growing downward and you can find it inside the soil right similarly in sugarcane you would have seen in south india everyone who celebrates pongal they kind of celebrated with sugar canes so you would have seen these structures arise out of sugar cane each of these is a node and you can see that the nodes that are present closer to the soil they will start giving out these roots and they eventually grow towards the soil and provide additional support for this plant okay so these are the two examples for modifications of roots where they're providing support here these roots are not helping in absorption or anchorage. They are providing support, right? So that is why it is its uh, root modification. Okay. So this is the third type of root modification where roots help in respiration. Um, you know, in halophytes or uh, in plants or trees that are growing near waterlogged areas, near marshy areas, the roots do not get sufficient aeration they do not get sufficient oxygen and that is where these roots come into picture i'll tell you what exactly happens here you might think that roots may not need oxygen but every living cell will need oxygen because oxygen is required to break down food and produce energy right so without energy any cell will not be able to function be it in any part of the plant right so roots also need oxygen what happens in plants is between the soil there will be some air spaces from that oxygen uh, from that air plants take in oxygen and they use it for the respiration 
what happens in such conditions is that water is locked and there are not air spaces or the soil is very very compact in marshy areas so the roots are not getting sufficient oxygen required for their respiration so in such cases what happens is this is again very beautiful usually when we talk about roots we th we we say that they are positively geotropic right we say that they usually grow towards the soil towards the ground towards gravity but here this is an exception this is a deviation from that over here these roots grow away from the soil these plants do have normal tap roots that grow towards the soil and helps in providing support i'm sorry uh, helps in anchoring the plant and helps in absorption but the problem is they're not getting sufficient oxygen or ga gaseous exchange is being becoming a problem so in order to help in that additional roots are formed that will jut out of the surface of the soil or wherever they are present like these marshy areas and these conical conical structures that you are seeing here these will have tiny pores present on them and through these pores gaseous exchange can take place so that is how these help in respiration isn't it beautiful so example for that is rhizophora i repeat these plants will have normal tap roots along with that this is a root modification where it's helping in respiration it's helping in exchange of gases so these roots grow above the soil or above wherever they are present above the substratum they are negatively geotropic for a change these roots do not grow towards the soil they have minute pores present on them which will help in gaseous exchange all right i hope that is clear so with this we have finished the morphology of fruit regions of fruit and modifications of fruit now it is time for us to move on to the next part which is the stem right so uh in the beginning of the chapter i told you that the seed will generally have an embryo and in the embryo you will find two parts the radical and the plumule radical gives rise to the root and the plumule is the part that will give rise to the stem so the stem develops from the plumule present in the seed i showed this exact same illustration this part becomes the root that is the radical and the plumule part gives rise to the stem remember this is very important root radical both begin with r so radical develops from the root the remaining part plumule will give rise to the stem now let's learn about some other features of stems so generally it is the ascending part of the plant i want you to focus that every time you're saying usually or generally there will be exceptions because you can also find stems underground we'll get to it in just a little bit but for now remember usually so far whatever you've learned it is usually uh, the ascending part of the plant stems are the ascending parts of the plant so this stem this is the ascending part of the plant and uh, what is its uh, function Bas basically this these stems they bear branches they bear leaves they bear flowers they bear fruits so in stems you can find leaves flowers branches fruits and all of that now one thing i want to tell you okay yeah so i'll take this stem for an example in the stem you will distinctly find nodes and internodes so whatever i'm highlighting over here these are nodes so what are nodes nodes are those regions on the stem from which the leaves arise okay so these are the nodes this is a node this is a node this is a node all of these are nodes the characteristic feature of stems is that in stems you can find distinct nodes and internodes so you have nodes here again i repeat nodes are those regions on the stem from which the leaves arise and internodes are the regions between the nodes inter means what in between right inter class competition is competition happening between two classes inter college competition is competition happening between two colleges similarly inter nodes are regions that are present between two nodes so these regions are called inter nodes clear so the characteristic feature of stems is that they will have the presence of 
nodes and internodes. Now, I want you to understand one thing here. So, let's say this is a stem, this is a node and it's a node because the leaf is arising from that part. So, here you have the leaf. This angle that you have between the stem and the leaf is called the axil. I'm sorry. It's called the axil AXIL. Now, in the axil, you will find buds. Okay, so these are called axillary buds. Similarly, at the tip of the stem also or at the tip of the branches also, you can find buds. They are called terminal buds. Okay? So, in a stem, you will find axillary and terminal buds. There is one point of confusion for students over here. These axillary buds are present in the axil region where there is a junction of the stem and the leaf. Most students think or some students think that this axillary bud which is here is actually a part of the leaf which it is not. Axillary buds are parts of the stem and not the leaf. I want to make it clear over here. Okay. So, in a stem which is usually the ascending part, you have distinct nodes and internodes. Nodes are those regions from which the leaves arise. The region of the stem between two nodes is called the internode. And in the stem, you can find buds. Axillary buds or terminal buds. Axillary buds if they are present in the axil. Terminal buds if they are present at the tip. These axillary buds may eventually form a branch. Okay. So, yeah, so that's about the stem and if you have to talk about its color, you can see that in young stems, you can think of this as a young stem. In young stems, it is usually green, the stem and in older stems, it turns woody and a little brown. The color of young stems is green and as it becomes older, it becomes brown because it becomes woody. Okay, so that's about the stem. Now let's talk about, talk about the primary functions of stem. What do you think are the primary functions of stems? What is it meant to do in a plant? Alright. So, like I said, it bears the appendages, which are nothing but the branches, the leaves, the flowers, the fruits, all of that are born on the stem. So, one of the functions of the stem is to obviously bear all of these appendages that are very, very important for the plant. Apart from that, it also helps in conducting water and food. Now, you know that the roots absorb water, right, from the soil. Now, these roots are required by the leaves here because leaves perform photosynthesis. Photosynthesis requires water. The water that is absorbed by the roots here has to be transported up to the leaves. And that happens via the stem. Within the stem, in angiosperms, since we are specifically talking about flowering plants, you will find vascular bundles. Uh, so, those, with the help of those vascular bundles, Water is transported from the root to the leaves where it is required. And once the leaves, which is the kitchen of the plant, prepares food, that food has to be transported to different parts of the plant. So, uh, that also, food also is transported by means of the stem to different parts of the plant. So, these two are the primary functions of the stem. Is that clear? Now, you must have kind of guessed what a stem modification is. Sometimes, stems apart from bearing, just bearing appendages and apart from just helping in transport, they take up other functions by undergoing some changes in structure. Such changes are called modifications and the stems that have undergone such changes are said to be modified stems. Okay, I repeat, the primary functions of stem is to bear all of those appendages and to help in transport. Uh, of course, because uh, it also provides certain support to the plant, but apart from that, if it is performing anything else, then it is called a stem modification. So, what are some reasons or examples where stems are modified? Firstly, similar to how roots store food. Sometimes, even stems are capable of storing food when they are underground. Which is why when I said uh, stems are generally the ascending part or the above ground part of the plant. I said there's an exception. Sometimes stems can be found below the ground as well, which in which cases usually they will be storing food. 
all right um and uh, uh, apart from that they sometimes provide support and they offer protection they help in performing photosynthesis which is usually the function of leaves right leaves are involved in photosynthesizing but sometimes in some plants i'll give you examples what happens is the stem takes up the leaves function which is photosynthesis then vegetative propagation vegetative propagation is to help in uh, reproduction i'll tell you how exactly so let's start by talking about stem modifications for storage we learnt about root modifications of storage as well this can be a confusion point for some students where you cannot uh, kind of recollect which is a stem modification which is a root modification now in our lower grades we've learnt for the longest time that anything that is found below the ground is the root and anything that's found above the ground is the stem right which changes once you come to your 11th grade so how you can now differentiate whether a root and a stem uh, whether an organ is a root or a stem is by checking for the presence of nodes and internodes over here in ginger you can clearly see these lines these are the nodes if you observe carefully there will, there will be very thin transparent scaly layers also present they basically represent the leaves okay so you can find distinct nodes and internodes in stems which you cannot find in roots so though carrot is also meant for storage ginger also is meant for storage both are found below the ground carrot is a root modification because you do not see any nodes and internodes there ginger and potato they are stem modifications because they clearly show the presence of nodes internodes and buds you may have seen eyes in potatoes right so these potato eyes are nothing but the buds axillary buds so that indicates that it is a stem now you know that anything that is found under the soil is not a root it could be a stem as well right so here are some examples potato is a stem that is modified to store food ginger turmeric colocasia zameen khand which is also called amorphophallus all of these are stem modifications what are stem modified stems modified for here in these uh, species of plants they are modified to store food along with that they also act as organs of perination so um during unfavorable conditions the, these storage organs will help tide over the unfavorable conditions and on the return of the favorable conditions new plants new shoots above ground shoots can sprout out of these underground storage stems all right so in that way they help in tiding over unfavorable conditions now let's look at some modifications stem modifications in the form of tendrils you know in some plants the stems are very tender and um, very slender very weak stems they do not have very strong solid stems and in some plants that are that climb or that they run on the uh, surface of the soil in such plants there there will be a need of additional support in such cases what happens is the axillary bud present in the stems it will get modified into tendrils okay so here you can see this is a stem and here is the leaf i'll use a different color so this is the axil right in the axil usually you find a bud which has the ability to develop into a branch but in such plants which are usually climbers or runners where additional support is required these axillary buds get modified and develop into these coiled wiry structures called tendrils okay so these tendrils if it is a climber will help wind around or coil around any means of support like you, if you've seen cucumber if there is any other vertical support like a rod or another stick or another plant that is present this plant can sense it it will produce these uh, tendrils towards it the tendrils will wind around it so that these plants that themselves have flexible and not so strong stems will get additional support okay so this you can see in cucumber uh, you you can see that in pumpkins as well you can observe that in case of watermelons also 
and similarly you can see that in grape vines as well right so these are some examples where plants the stems specifically the axillary bud of the stem is modified into a coiled wiry structure that helps in providing its support all right now some stems are modified to protect the plants from grazing okay so some animals come and feed on herbivorous animals they feed on plants right so in order to protect themselves from these grazing animals in order to protect themselves from herbivory uh, from herbivorous animals what happens in these plants is again the axillary bud present in the axil will modify itself into a thorn so these pointy structures will prick these animals when they come to feed on them and they will learn that they should not go near such plants in that way these plants are protected from herbivory okay so what happens here these thorns will protect these plants from grazing animals so over here these stem modifications are providing protection to these plants you can observe that in citrus plants and i'm sure you would have seen bougainvillea plants which are very beautiful ornamental plants that you find in parks in restaurants so even in this plant it is highly thorny you can see here so this is the leaf this is the stem this is the axil you can see that the axillary bud has been modified to form a thorn all right so that's about stems that are modified to protect the plants so i told you in the beginning that sometimes stems take up the function of leaves right so sometimes when our mothers can't cook at home because you're sick or something the dad pitches in and they start cooking right so you can think of it something like that but this is not a one time thing this is like a permanent modification that has happened in the plant so forever over here the stem will only photosynthesize and the leaves are highly reduced okay so stem modifications for photosynthesis these type of stems are called phylloclades so what happens here is the stem will become succulent and thick usually you find this in regions that are very dry like in deserts okay so there's not much rainfall the soil does not have sufficient amount of water and uh, plants that grow in such regions over here the stem will become either flat or it could become cylindrical like you see here but it becomes fleshy and succulent and it starts taking up the function of leaves which is photosynthesis okay so over here whatever green color that you're seeing is actually the stem usually we tend to associate that anything green on a plant is green uh, leaves right so here again that is wrong not every green part in every plant is a leaf over here in cactus or in opuntia the green thick fleshy part that you see is actually its stem and you see these tiny tiny spines right these are very prickly plants so the spines that you actually see here these are the leaves that are reduced we'll come to that a little later but for now understand that stems can sometimes perform photosynthesis when does it perform photosynthesis in plants that live in arid conditions where there is not sufficient water the stems take up the function of leaves which is photosynthesis and such modifications are called phylloclades is that clear guys all right now let's move on to the next type of stem modification where the stems are modified to perform vegetative propagation now what do we mean when we say vegetative propagation you know that reproduction is when one plant gives rise to many plants right so sexual reproduction happens when it happens by means of seeds you may have seen how um sometimes if you like the color of a flower uh, or if you have a garden at home you could just buy rose cuttings somebody has a nice rose uh, rose plant you can ask them to give them the cuttings of the stem and by using just the stem you can get a new plant right so in that way also it is a reproduction only from one plant you got another plant but over here we are not making use of seeds it is not sexual reproduction if newer plants are obtained from one plant by its vegetative parts either its roots stems or leaves then we refer to it as vegetative propagation so over here we will see how stems are naturally uh, involved in vegetative propagation all right is that clear so 
let's move forward there are different ways where uh, stems are involved in vegetative propagation one of which is called runners so what happens here is i'm sure you would have observed in grasses or the next time you go to a park or you see grass growing somewhere try to pluck out one grass out of the soil you will see that a string of grasses will come out right individually just this much won't come there are high chances that a string of grasses next to each other will come out because the reason is that they are connected at the base here okay so underground stems these are underground stems or you can even call them sub aerial stems if they are present uh, just below the soil so underground stems of the of some plants spread to new niches and when older parts die new plants are formed over here why we are calling it vegetative propagation is because it is a kind of reproduction involving vegetative path right so right now if you look at it it is one plant but let's say somebody like us tried to pluck this out and this part got cut off so from one plant we got two plants now right so that is how it is helping in vegetative propagation uh, you can observe that in grass like i already said and also in strawberries okay so this is called a runner you can see it horizontal okay so uh, you have roots here you have roots here right now it looks like a single plant but if this is damaged due to any reason you will get a new plant from this and that is possible because of this runner that's why it's a stem modification for vegetative propagation all right now stolons these are very very similar to what runners do over here yeah this can be observed in mint and jasmine these are the examples you can see slender lateral lateral means what from this side slender means what very thin slender lateral branch arise from the base of the main axis okay so if you think of this as a main axis these branches arise for some time they will grow upward and they will arch down like this okay so and as they arch down and touch the ground roots are formed and the aerial part of the plant also will be formed okay containing the leaves so this is another type of stem modification for vegetative propagation it is called stolons next we have offsets offsets are usually found in aquatic plants like water hyacinth which is also called icornia and pistia i'll tell you what happens here over here the stem is horizontal okay so remember stems will have nodes and internodes right so nodes are present uh, at the nodes leaves will be produced and here you have the internodes over here in these plants the length of the internode is very short okay short internodes and at each node you can see both leaves and roots you can see a tuft of leaves above the water surface i already said these are aquatic plants right so these are found growing in water bodies so above the surface of water you can find a beautiful tuft of leaves and below that i'm sorry you can find a rosette of leaves and below that you can find a tuft of roots and this is the story at each node at each node above the surface you can find a rosette of leaves and below the surface you can see a tuft of roots over here again if this gets damaged or broken it helps in vegetative propagation is that clear i hope it is uh next we have stem modifications for vegetative propagation this is the fourth one we started off with runner then we did stole on then we did offset now this is called sucker over here what happens is the lateral branches that originate here they will grow horizontally beneath then they will become oblique oblique means what slanting understood so normally they will grow horizontally below the soil for a for some period and they will start growing obliquely which means they will slant upward come out of the soil and over there they will give rise to leafy shoots so these are called suckers you can see them in banana plants pineapple plants and even in chrysanthemum okay so these are about this modifications of stem for the purpose of vegetative propagation is that clear now that's about the modification of stem now let's move on to the leaf which is the third part of the plant that i said we will be discussing in today's session right so what are leaves leaves are lateral 
they are produced on the sides of the stem generally green because there are leaves that are non green as well i told you the example of cactus right where the stem was green but the leaves were like spines they were like tiny prickly structures emerging out of the stem where it is not green so there are reg uh, plants where leaves are not green so they are generally green but of course we have exceptions and there are they are flat structures they are flattened structures there are bone on the stem which is very clear they develop at the node this i have already told you when i discussed stem on the stem there are specific regions from which the leaves arise which are called the nodes node is a part of the stem and so are axillary buds remember this very clearly so they bear buds in its axil but this bud is a part of the stem remember that we are talking about it under leaf but axillary buds are part of the stem they bear buds in the axil which may la later develop into a branch where do the leaves come from they come from the shoot apical meristem okay so when you take a very uh, the tip of the stem like the tip of the stem they there will be meristematic tissue there i told you about the different regions of the root and i said there is a region of meristematic activity where cells are constantly dividing increasing in number something similar you will find at the shoot tip as well at the tip of the stem as well that is called shoot apical meristem so these leaves they arise from the shoot apical meristem and they are arranged in acropetal order what does that mean at the tip you will find young leaves and below towards the base you will find relatively older leaves that is what is meant by acropetal succession or acropetal order okay this is common in all plants the younger leaves are at the tip and the older ones are towards the base is that clear now wait i don't think i discussed the functions not yet okay so now let's talk about the different parts of a leaf typically in a leaf we can observe three different parts which is the leaf base the petiole and the lamina or the leaf blade okay so what is the leaf base leaf base is that part of the leaf by which it attaches to the stem if you can think of this as the stem stem and this as the leaf stalk this part is the leaf base this is the part through which this leaf is attaching to the stem right so this part this base of the stalk which by which it is attaching to the leaf it is called the leaf base i'm um, basically the base of the leaf by which the leaf attaches to the stem sometimes it bears stipules what are stipules stipules are these small can you see it here over here there are these small leaf like structures that are present at the base they are called stipules in some plants you can see them okay so these small leafy green structures that you see at the base of the leaf they are called stipules if stipules are present in a leaf such leaves are said to be stipulate if stipules are present if stipules are absent we say extipulate okay next we'll move on to the next part of the uh session which is variations in leaf base some leaf bases what happens is the base kind of expands and forms a sheath around the stem see this is the stem this is the leaf this is the leaf base sometimes this leaf base expands and covers the stem okay it can either cover the stem wholly the entire diameter or the entire circumference or it can partially cover the stem okay so the leaf will arise here the leaf base expands and covers the stem or forms a sheath around the stem sheath is basically a covering so such leaf bases are called sheathing leaf bases over here like i already said the leaf base expands into a sheath and covers the stem either partially or completely you can see that here so this portion is the leaf base right it has kind of expanded and covered the stem portion here entirely okay so this leaf base has covered the stem and that is why it's called a sheathing leaf base you can see this in monocots if you have seen sugar canes or grass or uh, not grass wheat or um, rice plants if you try to take out the leaves off of the stem you can see that the bottom part is kind of holding on to the stem because it's covered 
it's covering it okay so that's about the sheathing leaf base and then in some plants like pea plants the base of the leaf or the leaf base basically this will be swollen such swollen leaf bases are referred to as pulvinous i gave you the example of pea plant which is a leguminous plant similarly in some other leguminous plants also you can see the swollen leaf base i repeat leaf base is the part of the leaf by which the leaf attaches to the stem sometimes like in monocots it expands and covers the stem either partially or completely in which case it is called a sheathing leaf base because clearly it is forming a sheath and sometimes the leaf base is swollen like in uh, pea plants or in some leguminous plants in which case it is called a pulvinous okay so these are new terms make sure to write it down okay so that's about the first part of the leaf which is the leaf base now let's move on to the second part of the leaf which is the petiole petiole is nothing but the stalk of the leaf okay so this is the stalk what is the purpose of a stalk in a leaf why should stalks even be present because this will allow this leaf blade to flutter you know that leaves are performing photosynthesis right so they are taking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as an end product or a by product of uh, photosynthesis we get oxygen which the leaves release back into the atmosphere for that gaseous exchange to take place for them to you know get more exposure to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere it has to kind of move around and that is made possible because of the petiole it allows the leaf blades to flutter in the wind it does two things by allowing it to flutter once one thing is it cools the leaf and it also brings fresh air to its surface it is it kind of moves like a fan so when there is fresh air coming it's coming to its surface it can get access to carbon dioxide also and pick it up for uh, photosynthesis right so that's about the petiole which is the stalk of the leaf now comes the most important part of the leaf i would say which is the leaf blade or the lamina so this expanded portion of the leaf which is green in color that is called the leaf blade or the lamina so it is green and expanded region this has veins and veinlets these whatever i am highlighting right now these are the veins and apart from that there will be veinlets also present right so these are the veins and this central usually in dicot plants you can see a central prominent vein which is called the midrib mid because it's present in the center okay so this is the midrib what is the function of these veins veinlets within the veins you can find vascular bundle xylem and phloem so if water has to reach the leaves from the roots it's coming through these xylem elements right so that will these xylem is present in the ro root it is present in the stem and it's also present in the leaves and by means of this the plant will uh, the leaf will get water and similarly whatever food leaf synthesizes it has to be reached to other parts of the plant as well that also requires vascular bundle phloem and uh, that phloem also is present within these veins veinlets and the midrib right so uh, so these veins act as channels for transport of water minerals and food veins provide rigidity yeah they kind of provide a structure for the lamina the reason it is able to provide rigidity is because it will contain some dead cells that are known to provide mechanical support more about that you will learn in the upcoming chapter which is called anatomy of flowering plants okay the reason it provides rigidity is because there you have xylem and phloem there you will find some dead cells like sclerenchyma tissue so that will help provide structure and support to the leaves i hope that is clear now now you have seen so many different types of leaves right once you take a stroll in the lane that your house is in or if you just walk into a park you should start observing and appreciating nature and plants as well so you can see how in a short span of 100 meters you can find different plants that have so many different kinds of leaves so what really causes because of what are these leaves different from each other they could be different in their shape you know some uh, leaves are heart shaped like this while some are more oblong 
leaves can differ from each other in their shape because of their margin margin is this part of the leaf the sides of the leaf in some leaves you can see that the margin is very smooth like in this leaf and in some leaves you can see that there are some incisions right apex apex is the tip of the leaf you can see there is some extension in some apices in some leaves whereas it is kind of blunt in some so that also causes variations in leaves surface the surface area if you think of it um some leaves are very large and some are small if you look at the texture of the surface you know that some on some leaves you can find tiny hair present like a mat right so it's like a woolly mat that is present which you do not find on some leaves so if you think of the texture of the uh, surface then that also is variable extent of incision you can see that in some plants uh these incisions that i talk about are these tiny tooth like structures that are present in the margins of leaves in some leaves you can see that the incisions are very small and not so noticeable whereas in some you can see that it is very noticeable okay so the extent of incision also varies from leaves of one plant to the other because of all these things we can see leaves in so many different shapes and forms right so that's about leaves uh the variation in leaves now let's talk about venation what is venation venation is the arrangement of veins and veinlets in the lamina of a leaf we just now discussed that leaf has three parts leaf base um leaf stalk which is the petiole and the leaf blade or the lamina in lamina i said that it contains the veins and veinlets right venation is basically how these veins and veinlets are arranged in the lamina so venation obviously refers to veins right so there are two broad categories of venation which is reticulate and parallel reticulate venation in reticulate venation the veins and veinlets form a network you can see this in dicot plants like in mango leaves you can see this in um, mint leaf okay so you can see that there is a prominent midrib there are some veins and then the veinlets form like a uh, network right so here you can see within these plants the veins form a network right there it is called reticulate venation and this kind of venation usually is found in dicotyledonous plants okay next we have parallel venation as the name itself indicates veins here are found parallel to each other as you can see in the case of banana banana is a monocotyledonous plant so generally you find van, uh, parallel venation in monocot plants other examples for monocots you can see it in grasses you can see it in um, wheat plants rice plants sugarcane plants maize all of these plants are monocotyledonous plants if you observe the leaves you can see that lines are running along its length parallel to each other those lines are nothing but veins and those veins contain xylem and phloem okay if you observe dicot plants like mango or peepal or banyan then you will see that the leaves uh, in the lamina the veins are arranged in the form of a network okay now let's talk about the different types of leaves and this depends on the incisions in the leaf okay so we have two different types simple leaf and compound leaf now what is a simple leaf and compound leaf depends on the lamina alone okay now i showed you the variations in leaves right i said that the margin in some leaves is entire in some you can see these uh, teeth like structures at the margins which are called incisions right so simple leaves are those leaves in which the margin is entire it has absolutely no incisions it is fully smooth or it has incisions but these incisions are not deep enough to touch the midrib okay so you have entire or smooth margin or even if there are incisions 
the incisions there is a mistake here this is not lamina this is midrib the incisions do not touch the midrib these incisions do not are not deep and they don't come up until this midrib in such cases we say that the leaves are simple now what are compound leaves compound leaves are exactly what simple leaves are not so in simple leaves i said that um, incisions even if they are there they will not touch the midrib right so over here the incisions of the lamina do reach the midrib they are very deep and they reach the midrib and as a consequence the lamina is broken into many leaflets i'll tell you how exactly this happens assume this is like a leaf and say uh, the leaf has many incisions and the incisions are so deep right and they are touching the midrib that this leaf is broken and it has many leaflets now over here we consider this entirely as a single leaf and these parts as leaflets now you might be wondering if you look at such a leaf for example i've added a name leaf here you might say that this okay so this i i would say that this is entirely one leaf and this is entirely one leaf so you would ask how can one know if this is a leaflet or a leaf to answer that we must go back to the basics again where i said that the leaves are present in the nodes of the stem and at the axil of the leaves you will find axillary buds so in the case of neem you can see axillary buds present here but each of these leaflets do not have axillary buds is that clear so if you check for the presence of axillary buds you will get to know if that particular leaf is an entire if each of these is a leaf or a leaflet if you want to find out you have to check for the presence of axillary buds if axillary bud is present here then this these are leaflets if individually each each of these had an axillary bud then each of these would be a leaf is that clear in neem we do not see axillary buds over here but we see axillary bud here that means that this entirely is one leaf the incisions were so deep it reached the midrib that the lamina is broken into different parts that are called leaflets understood now in compound leaf you have two different types one is called pinnately compound and the other one is called palmately compound now pinna means feather okay so what happens in pinnately compound leaf is just like i told you in uh, with the example by giving the example of neem the entire lamina is broken into leaflets and these leaves have the appearance of feathers that is why it is called pinnately compound leaf over here this stalk is called the rachis r a c h i s this is called the rachis in palmately compound leaves palm refers to the palm like the palm of your hand imagine this was a leaf this has given incisions i mean the incisions over here have reached till the midrib eventually it became a leaf like this these are the leaflets all right over here it appears like the palm of your hand because all of these leaflets are arising from a common point which is not the case with pinnately compound in pinnately compound you have an axis which is called the rachis and from the rachis the leaflets will arise and in palmately compound you have these leaflets arising from this common point such that it gives the appearance of your palm therefore it is called palmately compound okay so these are the different types of leaves now let's talk about phyllotaxy phyll in botany 
means leaf anywhere you hear the term phyl p h y l you should uh, associate that with leaves remember chlorophyll chlorophyll is the pigment that is found in leaves mostly right so phyl is the term that you generally associate with leaves so phyllotaxy is basically how these leaves are arranged on the stem you have three different types there's alternate opposite and world and this classification is based on the number of leaves present at each node okay so on the stem you will have nodes and at the nodes you will find leaves present right so in alternate what happens is at each node there is only one leaf present and they alternate in direction this type of arrangement of leaves uh, or this type of phyllotaxy is called alternate phyllotaxy opposite will have two leaves per node okay so over here at each node you can see the presence of one leaf two leaf one leaf two leaf okay so this is opposite if there is more than two leaves per node we refer to as world phyllotaxy for example let's consider these nodes there's one leaf in that 1 2 3 similarly you have 1 2 3 in in each node there are more than two leaves then we refer to it as world phyllotaxy i'll give you examples for each of these some examples of alternate phyllotaxy are hibiscus i'm sure you would have seen hibiscus it is also called china rose this is a very on, uh, popular ornamental plant in india right it has very beautiful uh, flowers large flowers it comes in different colors but the red i think is the most uh, common one and then you have mustard this you would have seen in uh, the movie ddlj where uh, shahrukh khan is playing that whatever instrument and then there's a mustard field right those are the mustard plants and in this plant also you can see leaves that show alternate phyllotaxy at each node you will find only one leaf so you can see one leaf here one leaf here one leaf here sunflower again here you can see alternate phyllotaxy one here one here one here one here and it alternates each time okay so these are some examples for alternate phyllotaxy now i told you that in opposite phyllotaxy you have two leaves at each node now depending upon the plane in which the leaves are present at successive nodes we have two different types alternate superposed superposition means what present directly on top of in alternate superposed type of phyllotaxy you can see that the leaves at each node are present in the same angle so if you consider this to be one node in this node leaves are arranged like this in the next node also leaves are arranged like that okay so the leaf in the lower node and the leaf in the node on top of it are both present in the same plane so they are superposed they are present one on top of another so uh, that is called alternate superposed and alternate decussate is when they are at right angles so if in the in one node leaves are present in this angle or in this plane in the next one they'll be present like this in one they are like this in the next at right angles again in one they are like that in the next they are at right angles all right so this is called uh, op uh, opposite decussate here the successive pair of leaves are at right angles to each other here you can see over here they are in this plane again they are at right angles you can observe this in calotropis plant and opposite superposed you can see in guava plants is that clear so in opposite phyllotaxy you have at each node two leaves if they are in the same plane throughout it is superposed if they are at right angles at successive uh, nodes then it is called opposite decussate world phyllotaxy i said that from each node more than two leaves arise here clearly there are more than two one two three four and many more so this is referred to as world phyllotaxy you can observe this in the plant alstonia all right now let's move on and talk about the modifications of leaves 
the function of leaf primary function of leaf is to perform photosynthesis right sometimes the structure and the shape of the leaf undergo some modifications and apart from performing its primary functions it takes it takes up other functions which are referred to as modifications i've told you this earlier with respect to root and stem as well it holds good for leaf as well leaf modifications are those changes that happen in leaves when they're performing functions other than the primary function which is photosynthesis all right so here uh, yeah some examples why leaves get modified is to support and climb defense storage photosynthesis usually photosynthesis is the function of the lamina but as a modification in some plants the petiole becomes photosynthetic which also is a leaf modification and then to trap insects all right so let's look at these leaf modifications you've learned about tendrils and stem modifications right i told you that in cucumber pumpkin watermelon grape vine the axillary bud becomes the tendril and helps in providing support and helps in climbing similarly in some plants the leaves become modified to form tendrils these are called leaf tendrils again here there is possibility of you getting confused the function of stem tendrils and the leaf tendrils is the same both of them are helping provide support for climbing but in leaf tendril the leaf has modified to form the tendril whereas in the stem tendrils the axillary bud is modified to form the tendril okay you have to remember this very clearly one example for this is pea plant leaf modification for defense remember in stem modification i told you how in bougainvillea plant in citrus plant axillary bud becomes a thorn and it prevents herbivory or the grazing animals from feeding on it right something very similar happens over here as well uh, so over here in cactus or opuntia i gave this example in stem modification i called it phylloclade remember where the stem takes up the function of photosynthesis if the stem is performing photosynthesis what are the leaves doing leaves are highly reduced in this case and they form these spines now another point of confusion that students have is between spines and thorns both of their function is the same they will protect the plant from grazing animals they will reduce the rate of transpiration but their origin is from different organs thorns are stem modifications they are a, they are modifications of axillary bud whereas spines are reduced leaves both of them are pointy both of them are sharp but they are not the same okay remember this now uh one thing is this protects the plant from grazing animals another thing is that like i already said these grow in areas where there's not much water so if the leaves are very uh, broad and expanded there'll be a lot of stomata whatever little water is available in the soil the plant would have somehow managed to absorb but that uh, water also can easily get lost through transpiration it can get evaporated because of the high heat and humidity uh, and less humidity in these areas so in order to reduce transpiration and also protect the plant from grazing animals the leaves here are modified to spines remember leaf modification spine stem modification thorn function in both cases protection all right hmm here the leaf is modified for storage we've learnt about storage as a modification in stem in root and leaves in root we learnt about tap root modification in case of carrot turnip sweet potato stems modification we learnt about the examples of potato ginger tamarind zameen khand and uh, colocasia over here we are talking about leaf modified to store food which you can see in garlic and onion so whichever part we consume in garlic and onion in onion of course we consume the uh, what is it called the shoot part that they use in chinese cuisine uh spring onions that also is a uh, definitely a uh, edible part but apart from that these leaves these parts that we consume in an onion these are the fleshy leaves leaves have become thick and fleshy and uh, that stores food even in garlic these are called uh they are basically leaf modifications where they are storing food each of these is a leaf each of those garlic uh what do you call them those units that you take out of garlic they are all leaves each one of them is a leaf 
okay so pto or modified for photosynthesis i told you initially that the lamina's function is to uh, perform photosynthesis in some plants what happens like in the case of australian acacia this is the lamina portion and this is the stalk or the petiole over here what happens is this lamina is short lived it falls off very soon or we can say it is ephemeral so if the lamina itself falls off then who will perform photosynthesis for the plant in order to perform photosynthesis in such cases the petiole petiole which is usually very slender and thin becomes expanded it becomes like the lamina see if you look at it it, look, it looks like the lamina because it's expanded and lamina of leaves are usually expanded right so this petiole will take up the function of the lamina which is photosynthesis okay so this is called a fill load one point of confusion is between fill load and fill load fill load is when the petiole takes up the function of photosynthesis which we see in the case of australian acacia fill load is when the stem takes up the fu function of photosynthesis which we see in opuntia okay so here you can see this leaf here in this leaf the lamina portion has already fallen off and this expanded region is actually the petiole that is performing the function of photosynthesis is that clear now let's talk about leaves modified to trap insect you know in some plants which we call insectivorous plants plants trap insects and digest them why this happens is because such plants grow in soils that do not have a lot of nitrogen they are deficient in nitrogen the soils so in order to obtain nitrogen they trap insects they secrete enzymes that digest the insects and from the insects they will absorb the nitrogen okay in such cases in order to form traps for insects the leaves will get modified i'm sure all of you would have seen this plant called pitcher plant which is very beautiful to look at it has these pitcher like structures present and these pitchers are actually leaves that are modified leaves will form jug like structures and there will be enzymes present within so if an insect kind of falls into it the digestive enzymes will break the insect down and absorb the required nitrogen from it similarly we have another plant called venus fly trap over here this trap mechanism that you're looking at these are nothing but leaves that are modified to form these traps okay so over here leaves are modified to trap the insects so with that we have come to the end of today's session i'll quickly give you a summary we started off with the different parts of the plant then we spoke about the root the types of root systems the regions of the root functions of the root modifications of root then we spoke about the stem the different features of the stem uh modifications of the stem basically morphology of the stem and the different reasons why stems are modified we learned examples for all of them coming to the leaves we spoke about the different parts of the leaf we learned about venation we learned about phyllotaxy we learned about the different types of leaves based on whether the margin incisions reaches the midrib or not right and then we also learned about uh leaf modification so we've covered a lot of uh syllabus in today's session we basically covered the vegetative parts of the plant i hope today's session was helpful and i urge you all to read ncrt today itself so that these concepts remain retained in your memory for a long time so with this i will sign off from today's session see you soon